flying doctors and the paramedics of the helicopter emergency medical service have some of the most rewarding jobs in the world, but also amongst the most difficult and the most demanding. The service, HEMS for short, was set up in 1989, based here on the roof of the Royal London Hospital in Whitechapel, as a way of getting the skills and expertise of the hospital directly to the patient wherever it's needed most. When a call comes through from the London Ambulance Service, the team can be airborne within two minutes. Their patch is anywhere within the M25, that's the entire population of Greater London, and the service has already been called out around 6,000 times. This kind of work puts an enormous emotional strain on the crews. Almost every call out brings life and death decisions and doctors like Gareth Davis are only called to the worst, the most distressing of cases. All of the incidents we recorded took place over the period of about a month, but we've been back to some of the people involved to see what happened to them once the emergency was over. Patients who've been injured start the dying process from the instant the injury happened. My job is to go in and try and prevent each stage of that dying process. It can be very rewarding to halt each stage before you even get to hospital, rather than sit in a hospital and receive something that comes through the doors that is so far down the dying process, there's very little you can do about it. It's a chap that's supposedly been run over by a tractor. He's been removed from underneath the tractor. We're not exactly sure of his injuries. Do you want to just leave that for now and get get ready for an anaesthetic? All right, just relax, Dan. You're doing great, son. Keep going, Dan. Right, Grip Dan. your hand, Dan. All right, mate. Okay. He really was uh, in extremis when I got to him. His uh, crush injury to the chest had fractured all the ribs down both sides. And quite simply, the mechanics of breathing, the ribs, can't move the lungs up and down to breathe and there's a tremendous amount of pain associated with all those fractured ribs. Can we change that for a reservoir mask? The ribs had also gone on and lacerated the lungs underneath and there was a lot of bleeding around the lungs and a lot of air escaping around them. So basically he was unable to breathe, he wasn't getting oxygen in um, and eventually that causes death. Right, Danny, I'm going to give you some medicine now that's going to send you off to sleep and take your pain away, all right? You'll feel it going in now. Right, could all this kit start to move over that way and we'll put the two scoop, the scoop down either side? We need to chest drain that side. Hi, it's Gareth here. We've got a male approximately 50 years of age who's been run over by um, a bulldozer, effectively. He has a massive crush injury to his chest with bilateral hemoneumothoraces. He's been intubated and ventilated. Doesn't appear to have uh, any injuries that I can define at the moment, but he is hemodynamically unstable from his chest. We're going to airlift him back to you with an ETA of probably about 15... Yeah. ETA about 15 to 20. OK. See you in a bit. Bye. One of the fundamental philosophies of the aircraft is to get a, a doctor to the patient's side as soon as possible. So from the incident actually happening, you can get a doctor there in 17 minutes. Show you returning. You're clear, and the wind is estimated to be southwesterly less than 10. The patient is taken right towards the doors of the resuscitation room. And at the London, we're lucky we have a helipad on the roof and a lift that goes specifically to the resource room. We're going down in the lift now. We're going down into the, a room in the casualty department, all right, where we're going to check you out. Yeah. Now, when, when we get there, there's going to be about 10 or 15 people all dressed in yellow. They're going to come around either side of you, and they're going to examine you from top to toe, all right? Now, this is 
basically precautionary because you've been involved in a nasty accident and we want to check you thoroughly. All right? But it's a normal thing that's going on here and I don't want you to get excessively uh, worried about it. All right? When we got to him, he was alert and orientated, pupils equal and active to light, moving all four limbs. He had a massive anterior flail and was very dyspneic. His abdomen is soft and hasn't distended up. His pelvis seems intact. He's been hemodynamically unstable with his systolics dropping to 40 and has had a total of three and a half litres of fluid. Could we, before the chest train goes in, get the patient off the vacuum mat? So, Nurse Wong, can you sort out the, um, the team? We get a tremendous response when we bring patients back to the resuscitation room, uh, being greeted by a host of surgeons, cardiothoracic, neurosurgical, orthopedic anaesthetists who will then uh, process the patients as rapidly as possible and if necessary uh, operate on them uh, in the resuscitation room itself. We've had a call out to an RTA, a road traffic accident, where a schoolboy has been hit by a car. Did, did you get that in the back? Yeah, yeah I heard it. Yeah, okay. okay, we can land pretty close. There aren't any wires, a couple of trees. There's somebody wandering across. I think. Should we get pretty close? No, there's a little bit of stuff on the ground. I don't know what that is, whether it's rubbish or. It is a very special job for the pilots. Um, there are very few helicopter jobs that allow them to uh, uh, land in situations like this. Um, and it takes a very special sort of pilot to be able to do it they have to try and ignore the the medical needs of the patient and look in the cold light of day of whether it's safe or not to uh, to land the aircraft and they can't be pushed by uh, a doctor in the back saying that the patient's dying they have to make a decision to land the aircraft safely When there are so many people on scene, someone has to take some control um, and orchestrate things. When the doctor is on the aircraft for, for a six or nine month or even a year's period, he gets to a lot of crashes. And with that exposure comes experience and ability to see what has to be done next. Just accessing his left antecubital fossa, if you would. How old is he? I saw him go up in the air, come over and fall down, so I just stopped the car and ran to see what we could do to help. Patrick? Patrick, can you hear me? Can you open your eyes? Open your eyes for me. When you see anybody who's been injured, you have to treat them all in a very simplistic way to assess their vital signs. And the vital signs are, quite simply, whether they have a patent airway, they can breathe, whether they've got problems with that breathing, whether they've got a pulse and a good blood pressure, and whether they're conscious or not. And we assess the level of consciousness by the Glasgow Coma Score, um, which ranges from 3 to 15. The lower scores are associated with uh, being unconscious, and 15 is what you or I have. When you have a head injury, you may have a Glasgow Coma score of six, but that can deteriorate down to three because the brain will swell within the skull, just like when you twist your ankle. Patrick has sustained quite a nasty head injury to the back of his head, yeah. and what I want to do is take him back in the helicopter um, to the Royal London Hospital. He's reasonably stable at the present time. He doesn't appear to have injured himself anywhere else, but we need to give him a thorough check over as soon as we get to uh, to hospital and do a scan of his brain. Okay. And again. We're doing the breathing for him by this machine here, and by all these connections here, we're monitoring uh, uh, the carbon dioxide that's being exhaled in each breath. And with you doing that, we control the pressure within his skull because he's been hit on the head and his brain's beginning to swell because of it. And we're trying to bring the swelling down. Um, by uh, controlling how much carbon dioxide there is in the, uh, in the blood and this machine helps us to do that. 
um, and the rest of the machines are keeping an eye on his blood pressure and his pulse rate and making sure that he's got enough oxygen uh, in his blood because those are the sort of things that damage uh, damage your brain, low blood pressure and not enough oxygen. How long were we on scene there, guys? 31 minutes. Too long, too long. Should be quicker than that. This is basically keeping him asleep. This solution that I'm putting in now. It's keeping him asleep. And he's essentially he's got an anesthetic now, a general anesthetic like you'd have with any uh, operation. And it allows us to control his breathing. So we decrease the swelling in his head and to uh, control his other observations, make sure he's well oxygenated. Had a Glasgow coma score of three for approximately four or five minutes. On our arrival, his Glasgow coma score was eight. He was moving all four limbs to pain, localizing. Pupils were equal and reactive to light. He had evidence of a head injury with a large body swelling around his left occiput. Chest, abdomen, pelvis, and lungs don't appear to have been injured. He's been hemodynamically stable. You can have a Glasgow coma score of three with no pulse and no blood pressure, and you're dead. You can have a Glasgow coma score of three with some pulse and some blood pressure, which means you're just alive. It is uh, RTA outside a pub, Oxford Road, Uxbridge. Right, airborne at 5.8. There you go. It's top left-hand corner of square 53. I have actually been to that area before. Yes, you and I have been um, there and I've landed just on that junction just there. Yeah. The, the lady the jumped up there. Is, is quite representational of roads and we have to use it because the LAS use it. It's not actually very representational in real terms because these roads on the ground don't look yellow, they're not that <laughs> wide. Um, it shows some parts, in some parts it doesn't. But um, so what we'll do is when we get closer, we'll try and identify the actual scene probably might do one trip round it. If it's fairly obvious and there's a, there's a big landing site right next door, Mark will probably go straight in there. That's well, the roundabout. It should be just past the visual, visual, yeah. visual, yeah. Blue lights right where they should be. So we also know the wind from takeoff. Heathrow have just given it to me There's again. an ambulance on scene, somebody in the road. The exit, the other side of the road, there's a rather nice large um, car park with numbers written on it. I think yeah. I'll go for that one. Okay. So at this point, I'll bring it to the left. Once I'm visual with the top of that building. I can't see behind the tail, but... No, OK. I'm going to move it left a bit now. Yep. And I, the further I go forward, the wider the space will become. There's no wires that I can see. Don't come any further left. There's just a little bump of stone. No, I can come a bit further yep. right. Yeah, you're fine here. Yeah, I'm happy with yep. that. That's lovely. Yep, no problem at all. All right. You're done. Wheels are done. OK, clear, clear, to, clear to go. Brakes staying okay, off. Down on seven. You OK, George? It's not pinching your bum here, George, is it? This guy's been hit by this car with momentary loss of consciousness. He's now fully uh, alert and orientated. He knows what's going on. He's got some fractures of his uh, lower limbs. We're just going to take him inside the ambulance now and have a closer look at him, but I think uh, basically he's not too badly injured. What happened? Uh, there was a white car coming along here pretty fast. And the man was crossing the uh, road here and he hit the uh, man on the window screen and he fell there and landed and he cut all his head. It's very important to establish mechanism of injury and by looking at the car you can uh, tell exactly what's happened to the guy and you can see from that windscreen which is probably his head that's made that mark. 1.2? That's his head, the second one. Let's carry him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's conscious and he's uh, confused at the present time, um, but his, his observations are otherwise normally. But I think given the, the dent he's made in that, um, okay, well, and it has been by his head because you can actually see hair in the, uh, uh, in the cracks. So we'll take him by uh, air ambulance to, uh, to the London.
is shot down by the West London Shooting School. You see all the clays underneath us. No, I didn't. It's just down. Oh, that one, yes, yeah. Closer to it, yeah. 1100 feet. What do you mean for the uh, BT Tower? Yes, no problem. <laughs> When we're not flying, the doctors from the helicopter look after patients on the trauma unit, which is an intensive care unit dedicated to trauma patients. Danny Cole, the patient that we rescued from the digger yesterday, has been brought back to the Royal London Hospital. He's asleep, he's been anaesthetised, he is stable, but his condition is still regarded as serious. Trauma is basically mechanical injury. Somebody who's been run over by a car or involved in a car crash or um, jumped off a building or pushed under a train. These individuals have sustained injuries um, from that and that's what we call traumatic injury. I have to say, to come in just this morning and see how he is, is a big surprise. I mean, he's yes. doing a lot better than most people predicted. The main problem is is this is the the rib fractures that he has have damaged the lungs underneath the lungs are damaged but badly well not as badly as we thought um, fingers crossed if he keeps making this uh, progress so the lungs at the moment are then we're doing the breathing for him but yeah. um, we're not having to support uh, the function um, as much as we expected. Mm. What happens is when the lungs are damaged, they actually swell up just like if yeah. you twist your ankle, it swells up over the next mm. 24 hours. The lungs do the same, but the lungs have to oxygenate the blood. That's their function. He was he's very lucky to be alive, I think, because mm -hmm. considering he, the vehicle that he was run over by, um, he's very lucky to be Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's a strong man. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. obviously. Yeah, strong and lovely. Plugged in, ready to roll. We're just getting some warm fluids here to take out. These have been preheated. Oh, you look so different. <laughs> Where's your head gone? Truck overturned, driver knocked out. And it's exactly where that other car overturned, do you remember it? The priest. The priest? It was upside down. Really? Right you were there. Where was the, the black uh, flat sticker on the front of the aircraft? You parked in the middle of the road. Oh, yeah, yes, oh, yes, 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 I yes, I remember. Yeah, yeah. We'd only just been re-sprayed. Yeah. First, yeah. second day. <laughs> oh, that's the one I sent you to. Yeah. And he was in there praying when we got there. Yes, Whitney. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Hung on to his beads. I got an eye. Yeah. Just coming up on scene. Will we be the first ones? Uh, yeah, I think it will. Uh, Lima one zero one control phone. Uh, it's about three minutes before you, but I think it should be the first. And that's where the junction, according to. Well, there's a flashing light there. That looks like a yellow one. Yeah. That's right. We'll go we're once round and have a quick look. On the left-hand side, got it, visual, down here. Truck on its side, and it uh, it looks exactly as given. If you want to jump. Yeah, I don't mind. Keep coming, keep coming. No, I think, I think you're going to be all right, Richard. No obstructions. Keep going, keep going. Keep going. I might just go over there, about sort of 50 yards. Yeah, OK. He lock yeah, he's got it. OK, we're going to move. Is there a, fi a fireman in? Who's that? Oh, hi. You're in charge, are you? Yeah, go on. Right, this guy's got a head injury. Um, 
He's been knocked out for a period of about 10 minutes, we believe. We can't identify any other injuries at the present time. Yeah. And he's stable, so... When we set off to an accident, we have very little idea about what we're going to. When we get there, sometimes there may be 30 or 40 emergency personnel on scene. It's the doctor's job to try and channel everybody's enthusiasms and activities towards the patient. It's important that they get treatment while they're trapped and then that we get them out quickly and to the most appropriate hospital. At the moment, he's sort of... We can't get him out because his spine has bent doubled and he's not conscious and... Um, yeah, yeah, please do. Do you see the other end of that blade? You can see the other side of that blade, can you? You know where it is relative to his head, because it's about this far from his head. As long as you... We've got two options. We can either just drag him out of the uh, cab and possibly damage his spine and exacerbate other injuries, or we can just very slowly take the cab to bits and make sure he comes out without doing him more harm. And as he's stable, um, that's exactly what we're doing at the moment. Couple of minutes, all right? Yeah, that's great. Oh. Where's the trolley bed? The helicopter's kitted out exactly like an intensive care unit. We carry the drugs, the monitors, the ventilators, everything that you'd find inside a hospital. When we arrive at the patient's side, effectively, the hospital is coming with us. Can I have a scoop? OK, same. I'll, uh, I don't think we're going to need it on him, actually. OK, mate, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Um, all right. Do we know what hospitals? I know it's a local one. I'm just going to decide now which hospital yeah. he's going to go to. We have a computer system which we take with us in the aircraft that allows us to uh, see which is the nearest hospital to the incident, which is the nearest neurosurgical centre, which is the nearest cardiothoracic centre, and which is the nearest trauma centre. A hospital may be perhaps one and a half miles away, but because of local traffic conditions, it may be quicker to simply take the patient in the aircraft and take the patient to the Royal London. Oh, as you can see under there, there's a guy, a motorcyclist has gone underneath the, uh, the lorry here. He's unconscious, uh, barely breathing. He's trapped by his legs. We're going to jack the lorry up and get him out and start to work on him as soon as possible. What's your name? Hello? What's your name? Yeah. So we're ready to start moving his legs and get him out. Okay, yeah, yeah. Just pull him out. Alright, if you can do you want to support his arm. So we're just gonna get you out from under here now. Alright Jason, here we go. That's it. Alright, just do it very slowly. Right, okay. We'll go by land ambulance to uh Charing Cross. We'll intubate him now. Okay. Hi, it's Dr. Gareth Davies from the Helicopter Emergency Medical Service here. We've got a patient for you we'd like to bring in by land ambulance. He's a male approximately 25 years of age who was a motorcyclist who's been in collision with a lorry. He has a Glasgow coma score of four on scene with evidence of a base of skull fracture. He's been anaesthetized and intubated on scene um, and is stable at the present time. He may have fractures over his lower limbs, but his leathers and his boots um, are holding them together, so we haven't actually taken them off to... Uh, uh, make a closer analysis of it. But we tend to take him by land ambulance to you and should be with you in approximately uh, 10 to 12 minutes.
He's hanging on, you know, but he's got quite a nasty, uh, nasty head injury. He's fractured the base of his skull. Hello. Hello. Nineteen ninety one. Ninety one. Yeah. Oh, ninety three. Patrick. Patrick, can you hear me? Can you open your eyes? Open your eyes for me. It's a type of medicine where you you can get an instantaneous success. You don't have to wait weeks or months to see something turn around from catastrophe to out and out success. It was wonderful and I mean I can't thank them enough, there's no way I can thank them because they saved his life and without that I just do, I don't even want to think about what could have happened. Hi, we were so lucky because it was there and it, you know it was there at that time and they got him to the hospital within seven minutes and he was worked on on the ground even before he got to the hospital. I was in a coma for five days. He had, a, he had a, an injury to his brain. Uh, he had a blood clot and a bruised brain to begin with and things weren't looking too bad. But what happened six hours later was his brain swelled and it swelled so quickly and so fast that all they could do, the only option they had left, was to put him into a deep coma like Brain did to rest his brain. And um, they told us that his brain could swell up again, but luckily it never. And we were living from hour to hour with him at one stage um, for about, I'd say about 20 hours. And then it got to every eight, nine hours, and when it didn't swell again, then we knew that we were in, he was in with a fighting chance of surviving. Where's the accident? Just there. Oh, I don't know. They stopped the traffic Yeah, they stopped the, the traffic. Place. They might have been letting us in there. Where the hell is it? It's where all those gaggle of police cars are, I think. OK, should we go on the road? Yeah, we can drop them, can't we, Alan? Yeah, we can drop the traffic them. Get yeah. OK. This job's out at Hanger Lane, which has to be one of the busiest intersections in the London area. It's my tail with the central reservation I'm worried about. OK. Where's your pain? All right, OK, what we're going to do, we'll cut this off, we'll give you a drip and I'll give you some morphine to take the pain away, all right? Mm. You know, just one minute he wasn't there, I was just driving along, yeah. the next minute there he was. You know, I slowed down and just... You know, I'm slowing down at the time. When he hit the side leg, that is a long one. Right, we'll take him. We'll take him to the plastic surgeon as um, the London, OK? Yep, fine. Do you think he's come from, he's come from your driver's side, he's walked between the two cars? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's got what happened, because, you know, because when, when he, because he hit the cut of the van, and he fell back. OK, you've got quite a, a quite badly damaged left yeah, foot there, all right? Broken it, it is broken completely. What I'd like to do is actually take you back in the ambulance to um, the Royal London Hospital, OK? Well, where's that? It's in Whitechapel, but they have not had Red base, medic one priority. Medic one, guys. Yeah, we're on scene with this gentleman uh, um, at Hangar Lane. He's been hit by a car and has a partially amputated left, uh, left foot. Um, what we intend to do is take him back to the London um, by air ambulance. OK, message copied. The road is actually now clear. The police have stopped the traffic. How are you feeling, David? Still in a bit of pain? Not too bad. Not too bad. All right, tell me if you want any more, all right? I've got lots on me. Have you got any earplugs? <coughs> Okay. 
got one axis line in his left anticubital fossa through which he's had about 300 mils of crystalloid, 20 milligrams of morphine, and 12.5 of stematol. The foot distal to this fracture laceration, there was uh, no pulse on scene, but it looks to have pinged up a little bit now. Right, okay. Basically, he's, he's uh, got an open fracture of his ankle. His foot really looks like it was half hanging off, but it's, dis it's relocated well. The dislocation, pressure dislocation has gone back into place, and the circulation to the foot appears quite good. So though on the face of it, it looks a very nasty injury, it should respond quite well to, to standard orthopedic uh, fixation techniques. Initially, when I looked down and I saw my, my leg hanging to the left, it appeared that it was going to fall off, and I thought, my God, I think I'm going to lose it. That was my initial thoughts. But they were, uh, at the hospital, they must have been terrific, you know, with, the, with all the bits and pieces they put in. Uh, and I've got quite a bit of mobility now. I can't speak more highly of the helicopter rescue service. If it wasn't for that, I think I would have lost my foot. The team that they have at the hospital are absolutely amazing. Technically, from a medical perspective, no one is really in charge, and you can arrive on scene and look very bolshy um, if you start dictating to all the emergency personnel who've probably been there two or three minutes before you, telling them to do X, Y, and Z. Um, it's, it's important to have good teamwork. Well, let's go down. And see yeah, I mean the not. police will. Um, I'll put you on the green you. because there's nowhere suitable around here. Yeah, yeah that's right. Okay, you've seen the site, site have you? Yeah. yeah, thanks. What's the name of the road, Ian? Minford. Minford Gardens. Yeah. Okay, there's road. a little kid running. Yep. There's nothing out there. Right, your side. Yep, keep coming. And keep going. The relationship between the team in the aircraft and the ground crews is on the whole very good. Sadly, now and again, we have individuals who take a dislike to us and give us comments like cowboys swanning out of the air, which is sad because we're all trying to work in the best interests of the patient. Hi guys. Right. I cancelled you. Have you? Yeah. I haven't heard anything. Yeah. Right, what's the problem? Uh, oh, you don't know. I don't know. You're right? Yeah. 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 So. so there's only the one casualty, is it? Yeah, that's all. That's a typical uh, reaction there, wasn't it? <laughs> you actually cancelled us, did you? Right, okay, what's your call sign? Oh, is he? Right. Okay. It pisses you off really, isn't it? I mean if we just got a, a bit more information from the call. Hey? Yeah, yeah. But I mean if we got a bit more information from the call, whoever put the call in. It's amazing. They're not always that keen to see you. You think it would be in the patient's interest. But uh Sometimes they're just uh, not having any of it. Yeah. Just my luck, I'll get bloody run over now. We do have to go to suicides, people who've jumped off buildings, thrown themselves under, underneath trains. Um, and basically it seems like a bit of a paradox that we should be, A, trying to save life, um, but having to go to patients that actually want to die. Hello, Hemsops here, Medibank scrambling to square 330. What have we got? A fall, 40 foot, onto, we don't, don't know. know. Um, it's actually given here as a jump. 
Right, okay. But we don't know until we get there. True enough, true enough. Echo 210, know that we're coming. How many stories did you say? Five. Paperwork's on your left. No, it's not. No, it is. Okay, got it. This is the Whittington, but road, there's no ambulance on scene, chaps, right. so we're actually looking for yeah, a group it. of people. We, we've so, I've seen it, David. Yeah, is it the orange? See, see the block of black flats at nine o'clock, the yeah. short one, about five yeah. floors high. There's a load of people on the yeah, grass. Yeah, that's what I saw. Yeah. See the right. church now on your nose. Yeah. If Just you go right to the church, there's a block of flats about oh five yeah, stories. Oh, yeah, gotcha. On the uh, grass, mate. Okay, I'm not going to have to kind of come down gently. Yeah. Keeping clear of the flats here. Yeah, you're well clear my side. That's it, you don't have to go any further forward. Okay. As no. you come down, you've got 20 feet to come down. Can I go right, uh, left at all, or is it, or are you happy there? It's just a touch, about two feet, that's fine, you're in now. Okay. <laughs> you got the suction. Yep, that's great, mate. Right, get the suction out for me, Al, will you? Do a cut down that side. It's unknown when the calls are rung in to LAS. We don't really know whether the patient really wanted to commit suicide, whether he tripped off the building, whether he's pushed off the building. So any jobs like that, we simply have to treat as an ordinary job. And when you're on scene, you certainly can't make any decisions with the people around you. Um, there is a cauldron of emotion there. You have to treat each job as a patient that's multiply injured um, and do your best to resuscitate them. We haven't been managed to establish a drip in this gentleman and his heart has stopped and he needs to have fluid put in to restart his heart and that's what we're attempting to do at the present time. Okay. Where did he come from? Top floor, we believe. Top window. Everybody's happy, I think we should call it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you can pump down. Sure. Sorry about that. Don't bother. What time are you going to call that, Doctor? <sighs> PLE 25 pass, yeah. Some patients may be dead the instant the accident happened. Some may die a few minutes afterwards. We, in the air, doctors in the aircraft, can actually resuscitate patients from a clinically dead state to someone who is alive. We have to work on patients, do the procedures that we can do, such as intubation or draining the lungs, and if after a period of time the patient doesn't respond, we have to make the decision to give up. Um, and that point, um, we pronounce life extinct. Uh, no, it's all right. It's just down here. You're all right. Thanks very much. I don't believe you can really train people to sort of cope with the, uh, the, the, the doom and gloom that the job presents to you. And certainly in this job where you'll see way more than you would um, in any other post. All right. Uh, when we got here, they obviously cut her down. They've moved. She's got quite a nasty mark around her neck. I managed to intubate her. Right, okay. Have you checked your tube? Yeah, You're happy about it? Yeah. Do you mind if I just have a yeah. quick listen? That's it. Um, IV. Yeah. Here. Do you want any more, Paul? One more, please. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. just stop it. massage. Just stop bagging as well. I mean, that could be oh, fine, VF. Yeah. Okay, yeah. can you uh, yeah. <coughs> just put some gel pads on and pour a few with defibrillator? <coughs> Who actually found her? Okay, thank you. Yeah, no. feel for five seconds. Carry on with massage. We can have the bicarb out of our bars it. Paul, could you go to our drug in the Thomas pack yeah. and get the bicarbonate in the yellow? Right. Paul, do I take that? Yes. Right, 
right, let's just do another cycle, wait for that uh, adrenaline to go around. She's had three of atropin, hasn't she? Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. How old is she? 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. Yeah. No idea what time we got here. Mm -hmm. We got here at 14.23. 14, you, you did? We did. Yeah. You were about two or three minutes after us. So we go to 15, three minutes. Okay, do you want to stop there? You just check for a carotid pulse as well. Okay. I think we should call it. Yeah, that is good. Yeah. Right. Okay. Should we turn that? Just turn that. Are you going to Who's pronounce downstairs? life extinct for us? Yeah, we'll do that at uh, 14.45. Thank you, and your doctor? Dr. Gareth Davies, Helicopter Emergency Medical Service, Helipad. Oh, you've done it. Helipad, yeah. Royal oh, London Hospital. Thanks, mate. Thank Whitechapel. They, uh, they don't come much worse than that. You try not to get too hooked into the social and psychological aspects of it because you simply stop functioning. You have to divorce yourself from that and simply try and treat the patient. Um, and if you can't uh, treat the patient um, and you have to pronounce them dead on scene, you're then your next challenge is to break that news to the immediate relatives. I'm afraid I've got some terrible news. No, no, don't. Please. I'm afraid. We haven't been able to uh, resuscitate you, your doctor. <gasps> if you have to break news, they want, they need to be told that the patient's dead, and you have to use words like that and not use euphemisms. Um, and I'm, I'm very sensitive as to the massive problems that I could create by just swanning in in an orange suit and a helicopter and then swanning back out again. You feel pretty useless. I mean, you you feel uh, you're just standing there, and people are wailing and throwing themselves around, and you just you wonder what what do I do next? What's the normal thing to do here, um, and what's the best thing to do? And just just make a quiet exit. I think. I think yeah. I, well, I try and get one. I, what I try and do is if one of them is reasonably controlled, to talk to them and um, impart what information I have to do. People often ask me whether I take all this gloom and doom home with me. I take the medical decisions home with me, and only very rarely do I take the sadness of certain events home. I was scared to come into the hospital. I waited outside till they went in and to see if he was still alive. And for the first, I can't remember how long, I'm all confused with the dates and all that, but for the first few weeks, I just thought, you know, I wasn't going to make it. I'm going to give you some medicine now that's going to send you off to sleep and take your pain away, all right? And we'll wake you up in the hospital. I just can't believe it, how quick he has recovered, you know. Well, not completely recovered. He's got a way to go till he gets his strength back and that. Not getting too tired, are you? It is a marvellous recovery, isn't it? He's a different colour to the man who was uh, crushed under the caterpillars, isn't he? Isn't he just? It's Looking good. Same it's hard to envisage when he was in that the, bed there. Yeah, yeah. From that, from then to now, it's just fantastic. Or oh, thanks to you. Never say die. Never say die. Quite right. <laughs>
Thank you all very much. Thank you. The Danny that I knew from the beginning had a big swollen head with a crushed chest. He was totally blue from the chest upwards because of all the congestion. And to see him come back as a, an ordinary individual uh, like he does now is, is, is very, very rewarding. In Danny's case, he had such severe respiratory difficulty. He was really in the sort of last throes of, uh, of uh, departing this world. It was a cold day, the 1st of December, 1993, I'll never forget it, about 10.30, I think, in the morning, to be exact, and everybody was going to tea, and I was moving the machine, it's a tracked machine, and I was moving it from one place to another, and I decided to get out, there was a scaffold, a big 18-foot scaffold tube lying on the ground. Oh, I just relaxed, Danny, you're doing great, sir. Great going, Danny. I got out of the machine, I stood on the track, but I had a big woolen jumper on and it was caught in the lever and when I got off of the track of the machine the jumper was caught in the lever and it pulled the lever that way and of course that sent the machine swear turning around and it pulled me in under it between the track and the cab and it squeezed me in there. Danny, I'd never be much closer, well I'd never be any closer to death than that. I only had uh, a couple of pints of blood left. I think another seven or eight minutes and I would have been dead anyway. I remember the ambulance man saying to his mate, uh, this fella hasn't got much chance or some words to that effect. And when I heard that noise, when I heard the helicopter, you know, uh, well, I thought to myself, well, there's hope now. That was one of the best minutes of my life, really. Back left's good. Uh, is money more important than life? when it comes to the helicopter being stopped, just just one helicopter for 12 million people. It should be four or five helicopters in London, never mind one. I love this job so much because the rewards are immense. There aren't many jobs in medicine where you can actually save somebody's life um, over a few minutes on a regular basis. Um, most people who do accident and emergency medicine or casualty do the job because of the exciting moments in the resuscitation room where they can save somebody's life. And here we get to do that um, once a day, several times a day. Mm -hmm.